You will need some good quality cork. If in large singular pieces, cut those down to size with the orchids in mind that you would like to mount. You will need a catch tray to contain the mess if you don't want to chase after dust and other mess as you prepare your mounts. Any kind of material to create your hanger, I chose some banda hanger wire which I'm recycling, but if your mount isn't going to be so heavy long term, a more subtle option could be a strong twine. In my case I have some wire cutters, scissors would be an option if you chose twine, then some kind of handy dandy tool that will help you easily create a hole in your mount to feed your hanger through, and of course, you will need your mount. Hi! Surprise! We are going organic on some mounts. I know, I know. But I will explain why in the videos when I get to mounting orchids that I currently have on inorganic mounts. Why I am switching. This video is basically only about how to prepare mounts. In my case, I will be referring to cork, what to look out for, how to prepare, plan ahead, etc and sterilizing the pieces of cork if that is something you would prefer to do but first thank you for clicking on this video thank you for being here i really got stuck in it was about time too i've been talking about this for months orchid ninjas have already been on the road trip to the source of my cork so if you would like to check out that exclusive content join the channel become an orchid ninja and enjoy the ride but now let me share my thought process with all the pieces I have prepared from the two large pieces of cork that I sourced. The size of the mount will determine how many holes you will have to drill to make a hanger strong enough. Don't be shy to go a little over the top with the size of your mount because the intention is to mount the orchid and then leave it to take over the mount. Consider the growth habit of your orchid and how the roots behave over the course of their lifetime and choose the mount size accordingly. The mount I'm preparing here is for a Brassavola species, Brassavola flagellaris. The size is overwhelming, the weight of the mount is insane, <laughs> but the reasons I just mentioned is why I opted to make this mount XXL. The orchid has a creeping rhizome, which can be contained on a smaller mount, but the roots of this orchid caught my attention over the past five years. It is not a branching root system, and they grow in length, sometimes extending from one year to the next. So with all that being said, I chose this size mount to serve the root system of the orchid. You may need to consider your situation. How much space have you got for larger mounts? If you're short of hanging space, consider cutting your pieces to be able to stand up independent of a hanger. This will give you the choice of setting the orchid on a shelf, maybe on a humidity tray. Anyway, because of the weight of my mount, I am drilling two holes and opting for reinforced wire, which I reinforced by straightening it out using a drill and getting it tougher than the gauge it actually is. I will have to place this mount on a shelf during the winter. Simply because of its weight, I cannot have it hanging, but while outside, it will hang in the same place the orchid always occupies. So these are the two things to keep in mind if you can grow outdoors, partially indoors during the cooler months of the year to just tide your orchids over. You can hang and then you can place it on a shelf, cut the edge straight in order to do that. If you have a lighter small amount, you can check how it looks best by checking how the weight distributes in your hand. This will give you a great indicator for where your hole should go so that your mount hangs with a natural look. There is no rule of how the grain should be for how your mount should hang. It can be vertical, it can be horizontal, the roots won't know the difference. It looks more natural to have the grain going vertical, but if you don't have the luxury of getting a large piece of cork and cutting that to size, to how you want it, what you want it for, then the main thing to look for before drilling a hole into the mount is how does it hang and will it stay stable and not start to go askew with a single hole? Sometimes you may need to add a second hole to feed the wire through once again if the balance is a little bit off, but you get the look and position that you want. The piece I'm working with here is a prime example of the kind of cork you want to have for your mounts. As you can see, it still has bark at the back of it. This is super important because the bark acts like the glue, the concrete, to help strengthen the cork itself. It is also harder to drill through, so 
While the process of drilling through the cork feels like butter, getting through the park is totally different. Make sure that you have a firm grip on your mount and firm pressure on the drill as you go through. If the drill bit is not as long as the thickness of the bark, as in my case, I am eyeballing the hole I already drilled and then using that as a marker, I'm going in through the bark on the other side to meet the hole I already drilled. Also, maybe you notice that this piece of cork has a very indented hole in it when looking at it from the front. Well, this piece is allocated for my Dendrobium bensoniae, which has a mass of roots growing out of the back of the current mount it is on. I will break those roots when I mount this orchid, but what I'm hoping to achieve by opting to cut this mount out with this indentation in it is to have the orchid not pressed firmly on the surface of the mount without destroying all the roots. Instead, I hope to have some roots break only partially and then keep my fingers crossed that they will hold on, continue to function until the orchid grows new roots, something which is imminent and it will be a joy to watch them find their way to the cork. This is part of how I planned the pieces before I cut the big chunks. In this case, I feel as though I could have been more generous with the size of the mount for the bensonier seeing as she can live outdoors all year round. But I have others that I will be bumping up and their mounts will also increase in size. So here I am a little bit more conservative with the overall size of the mount. So you see with the first two examples, I have taken the large pieces of cork that I had initially and studied them, compared them to the orchids I intend to transfer to these mounts and planned ahead, not just for the orchid, but also for how I can accommodate the mount itself long term, given the culture and my conditions. I will walk through my thoughts and I will talk about the different ways you can prepare your cork when it comes to sterilizing it, ridding it from anything you may find suspicious, that something that could affect the health of your orchid long term, as well as I will tell you what I did with mine, why I did it, what I expect and if my intuition is wrong and something were to create a problem, what I intend to do with the orchid still on the mount. It would be awesome if you would please like the video, it's a tremendous help to the channel also, if you have not subscribed to the channel, your doing so also adds to the overall support of the channel. And while you are at it, do you know someone who would be interested in a video like this? Then the share option is there for a reason. And I thank you for that, as well as for everything else that you do, including spending time watching the video. Thank you. The piece of cork that I'm currently working on was picked and cut from the main block for another Brassavola species for exactly the same reasons as the first large mount. However, I did not need to go so over the top with the size of this mount because the root system of the Brassavola perinii is not as fast growing as the flagellaris. For that reason, I can be more conservative with the size of the mount. Something I want to point out with this piece of cork and my choice of where I drilled the hole is that without the residual bark at the back of this piece, the cork would easily split down the middle. So while I would have preferred the hole a little higher, I opted to go down further because of that natural break in the cork. The bark in the back being that part that holds the piece together, if I were to drill a hole where I had intended, I would have weakened that bark, possibly causing the mount to fall apart prematurely. Granted, it would have taken years to get to that point, but in the event that I drop the mount one day, drilling a hole where the cork is not solid would prove precarious. So, never mind, we will go down a few notches and hope that our planning will prove correct and the mount stays safe even if we were to drop it. Here's a fantastic little piece of cork, but wow, it may look small, but it is nice and thick. So it took a little convincing to get the drill to go through both sides to make the holes meet in the middle. To double check that I have a continuous hole, I used my tweezers to see if the two sides met and woohoo, they did. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Meanwhile, if it doesn't work the first time around, another little hole to get to the first hole I drill would not have been a problem, but it's nice to get things right the first time. <laughs> I was 100% sure where the hole for the hanger should be for this mount, but then I stopped because I wanted to be sure that nothing is going to splinter off 
while I'm holding the mount firmly, or even worse, drilling into a part of the mount that could potentially come flying off. What I did not add to all the paraphernalia at the beginning of things you would need for projects like this were safety glasses. I was wearing my reading glasses because I just dove into the getting these mounts prepared and was not bothered to go to the drawer where I have my safety glasses. So if you do not wear glasses as a norm, don't forget to equip yourself with safety glasses. You can see just how much tiny debris comes out of drilling a couple of holes and all that stuff is nasty when it gets in your eyes. But even worse, things can get really nasty if a piece of the bark were to splinter off in a larger chunk and turn into a projectile that could cause injury. So, check the stability of your bark. See if you can easily pull, push or snap off any part of the piece you are planning to drill into. During the firm grip and drilling, stay vigilant. There is no need to do it all at once. And if you have to regroup, reposition your hand before continuing, then do that. Your mount is not going anywhere while you reaffirm what you're doing before you proceed. Then get your wires out and prepare your hangers. But I wanted to show you that I'm twisting the two ends into what may be the hook so that it will hold up the weight of the mount and not bend, which could end up slipping off the gate and crash landing onto the floor. So with the reinforced wire and a double wrap, this hook is pretty sturdy and if I am in doubt when it comes to actually hanging the mount, I will reinforce the hook itself with a third wire and twist that around. <laughs> we shall see. Anywho, while I fiddle with the wire for my hooks, let me tell you how to best prepare your mount when it comes to ridding it of any critters or fungi that may be housed in the cork. The first thing is to know where your cork came from. If it was shipped to you from a country where it naturally grows, then usually the critters will have left what you've received already. Ants and spiders will be the first to go, so you can proceed to the next step straight away. Which is, if you eyeball your cork and like the actual look of the clean appearance of it, then as far as I'm concerned, there's no need to take it through the ringer and do any of the following steps. Just go ahead and mount your orchid and watch what the piece does within a couple of months. But if you want to sterilize your cork, then here's what you can do. First of all, take a brush, a soft bristle wire brush. I know that sounds weird, but there are tougher wire brushes and there are softer ones. <laughs> so with a softer wire brush, give the cork piece a good brush down. A lot of debris will come off, but it would be the first step if you want to ensure your mount is sterile from the get-go. What happens later is what nature does. After your piece got a good brush down, place it into the freezer for 24 hours. Then, straight out of the freezer into an oven that needs to have the temperature set to 230 degrees Celsius or 450 degrees Fahrenheit, but do not preheat your oven. You want the oven to come to temperature with your frozen piece of cork in it because the freezing of the cork will add moisture to the piece. This will melt and if it melts slowly as the oven increases in temperature, it will not boil on the surface of the cork. Slow and gentle evaporation, slow and gentle increase of the temperature will ensure that the heat will get into the thickest part of the cork without the outer part being scorched by the heat, while the inner core of the cork is still cooler. Once your oven has reached the set temperature, that is when you set the timer for 30 to 45 minutes to bake your cork. If you have the fan setting for your oven, use that so as to distribute the heat evenly around the piece. If you don't, check the surface of your piece at regular intervals, because what you do not want to have happen is to burn the rugged surface of your piece. Sometimes cork will bubble a bit when the temperature is too high. If you see that happening, dial it down a notch or open the oven door to allow heat to escape. Bubbling is rare, but seeing as all ovens behave differently, I wanted to point that out so that if you were to notice an uneven bubbling happening with your cork, you would not assume that it is because the water is evaporating. The moisture from the freezing process will have evaporated long before it would come to the stage of bubbling of the cork. So bring the temperature down fast, opening the oven door is best, and check your mount regularly. 
after the set time has passed, leave the piece in the oven until the oven has completely cooled down. Remove the mount from your oven, and then I hope that the first half of this video will be a helpful guide to drilling, where to position the hole, and then the material for the hanging device, hook being my example. Other ways of sterilizing that are less cumbersome are to pour boiling water all over the piece or actually put the piece into a pot and boil for 30 minutes. Then let dry completely and proceed to mount your orchid. Now, while the boiling water will sterilize the surface of the cork, the actual boiling of the piece in a pan of water for 30 minutes will draw out a lot of the tannins in the cork as well, which is a shame because tannins are awesome for orchids. So. If I had a preference, I would go along the long road with the freezer, then the oven, or just pouring boiling water over the piece of cork. But to finish off and answer a question you may have been asking yourself while I described how to sterilize cork, if you have made it this far, thank you. And if you have had that question, maybe, did I do any of what I just suggested to the pieces I dealt with today? <laughs> the answer is an emphatic no. I did not. I did not scrub, nor freeze, nor bake, nor use boiling water. All I did was buy the cork from a reputable, sustainable source, legally, saw some ants scuttle away as it was carried to the car for me, saw a few spiders that had hitched the ride to my side of the hood from whence it came, and then I placed it on the east side of the patio in the baking sun for several days, until I got around to cutting it and getting the pieces drilled and wired. Now that all that is done, all the pieces are still on the table, in the baking sun, until I'm ready to get the orchids mounted on them. Panic not! <laughs> what are the risks of me not sterilizing my cork pieces? Some fungi may activate that, due to lack of humidity I do not see now. Some bacteria may get excited the moment the mounts are misted several times a day. But the main thing I am guesstimating and gambling with is that the little microclimate of the cork with all the lichen and dead mosses will also revive somehow. And if that were to happen, then all the bacteria and fungi that may come alive again will be dealt with using hydrogen peroxide. If I see any negative results on the roots of the orchid or possibly on the leaves, hydrogen peroxide. Time will tell. But... This is a calculated risk I am taking because I'm in a very, very dry climate. So this cork came from a beautifully humid forest from the national park Los Alcornocales. It is now on my patio, where the conditions are less than favorable. However, some of it may come back to life after the misting, but if there are bacteria or fungi in the pieces, they will not be sufficiently served to thrive and prosper because these mounts are going to dry out super quickly. Now, if you are using cork in a very humid climate, humidity of 75% and higher throughout the year, then sterilizing is not that bad of an idea. The chances for fungi to activate and maybe cause issues are so much higher in a super high humidity environment. But know that, even if you go through all that painstaking sterilization process, kudos to you if you do that, know that any natural material that is exposed to water, humidity and fertilizer, something is going to come alive, even if it has been removed from the material itself. Because the air is full of interesting spores that may find a happy place on your mount, so if something were to settle in onto your mount that you do not want to have there, nuke it with hydrogen peroxide and everything should be just fabulous for your orchid. So that is what I'm hoping for with my mounts, not sterilized in a super, super dry climate. We are going to be okay. We may see some lichen revive. We may not. We may see other mosses come up that were there before or are in my environment as has happened with other mounts in my climate that, well, they didn't have moss on them and now they do. And those were sterilized and baked. So anything can happen. It's going to be a wonderful ride. I'm going to be looking forward to seeing how my orchids do, especially on the root front. Because my initial thing with the inorganic mounts was never to have to unmount an orchid and disturb her again. 
times change, plans change, orchids grow, conditions, circumstances change, and we have to adapt accordingly. But anyway, I hope that you will stick around for the mounting videos. I will probably not do them all at once, but as and when they come, I shall link them in the description. Meanwhile, subscribe, ding that little bell so that you will be notified of when the mounting videos come out, and then we shall follow the progress of my orchids, which I hope is going to be fabulous. Looking forward to having you join me on the transition of my inorganic mounts to organic mounts. <laughs> I know, right? Who the funk? Anywho, thank you so, so much for watching. Have yourself a fabulous day on that one condition, though, please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.